Tonight we begin this sixth, sixth chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 72nd lesson in this book. But Paul is still elaborating on this word, giving thanks always for all things unto God and our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. He's continuing to elaborate on that <clears throat> picture. The general teaching is that the entirety of life is set within the context of proper submission, no, no matter who you are. Yeah, amen. That's the nature of life in Christ Jesus. You might call it interdependence. Technically speaking, man is not a free moral agent. He wasn't intended to be. From the youth up, there's a matter of submission. And I know people may say, well, you're free to submit and free not to submit. No, you're not free not to submit. If you don't submit, you pay the penalty, period. That's it. You're never free to do what's wrong. Amen. People do wrong are enslaved. Yes. They're not free. They're in bondage. They're not free. Yeah. And people need to know this now. They need to know this because there's just too much, too much uh, bad teaching about this. Uh -huh. Amen. We talk about submission at its apex or highest point. The church being subject to Christ is the real issue. It gets right down to the real issue. It doesn't make any difference what, who does or who doesn't submit. It does, when it gets right down to the bottom line, what makes a difference is the church subject to Christ and everything else counts zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we're beginning to see here is that submission to Christ is not an easy thing to describe. It's not an easy, easy thing to open up. People tend to be too shallow about this. So God, on purpose, has created mankind and the interrelationships of mankind all around the concept of submission. Yeah, amen. Uh -huh. That submission is, an end, is not an end of itself. That is to say, if you submit to who you sub to, to submit to, that's just the beginning of the matter. That's not the end of the matter. That's to help you understand what's involved in being sub subject to Christ. See, it is... In his heart, all sin is self-centered. All sin is all sin is self-centered. John put it this way: all that is in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that's all self. It's all self. Nobody else. <laughs> it's all self. And submission is the opposite of, of self. Lower interests are always self-centered interests. Yes, Sister Maddie. Boy, oh, I'm so sorry. Are always self-centered interests. And they're all antithetical or contrary mm -hmm. to godly interests. Mm -hmm. See, self is to be mortified, is to be crucified, is to be denied. This is seen in the makeup of the human body, which is patterned after the body of Christ. Each member connects to the head, and then the head works through that member to the rest of the body. There is no self-interest. There's no finger interest or toe interest or hand interest. <laughs> That's not the way the body works. I do focus on its own interests, it's damaging to the body. Yeah. The eye well, gives itself to something. Well, yeah, but it's, it's minister, the, the head ministers that to the eye doesn't operate independently, see? Well, not independently. Yeah, no, no member of the body, physical or otherwise, operates independently. Yeah. It all, it all, in magnitude, in seeking the interests of some other part of the body, they, 
That's telling you what the truth of the saying here, yes. I was thinking about it. I guess any part of the body can't give itself to the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes. It can't the eye can't doesn't really give itself to that, does it? As an independent member. Yes, I see what you're saying, yes. <coughs> See, the, the lack of self-centeredness is what allows for the edification of the body. Amen. You can't have edification without this. As soon as a person becomes absorbed with self, they cease to be a functional member of the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, before you move uh, too far off of this, you, you mentioned that... Um, the, the members are connected one to another. Well, someone might think, well, how can the finger and the toe be connected? Well, by being part of the same whole, but there, and you mentioned that, that our bodies were fashioned after the likeness of the body of mm -hmm. Christ, which is important to see. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that is common to every individual member of the body is the blood. Mm -hmm. The blood, very good. And yes. so, and that speaks of the life of Christ yeah. and of the cleansing mm -hmm. yeah. that we received mm -hmm. of Christ. Now, the blood has to go to every, every single yeah, cell in the body yeah. Yeah. has contact with the blood, or Amen. it doesn't live. That's and see right. that commonality that yeah. causes that. That's that direct, that direct connection that we have with Christ. And by His direction, the body works together. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, the life of the flesh is in the blood. There it is, lived out for you. <coughs> now, Paul is showing that the whole fabric of society, by divine intention, includes the idea of submission from, from youth up. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Not quite as elementary as it may seem. I've said this before, I want to say it again, that the life of Christ is intentionally reflected in the domestic and social makeup of humanity. God has structured society to reflect this higher relationship. <coughs> He's shown us in husband and wife, now he's going to go down to children and parents. He will show that the relationship of children to parents also intentionally reflects the church in Christ, the relationship of church in Christ. If a proper, this, this is what, we're, what he's establishing, if the proper relationship between the members on earth is not seen, the relationship between the higher cannot be seen. Amen. That's, that's what we're going to see here. If this relationship down here becomes garbled, this relationship becomes, it's not obvious, it's hidden. Because it's, 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 because it's a, such a relationship, see, evolution couldn't produce this kind of relationship. And evolution is dog eats dog. Right? It's the way it is. It's the way it's structured. Evolution can't produce this submission type Concept. It was built built into society by God Himself. <laughs> now, when God made man, made man the first man, He was a fully developed man. But He's the only fully developed man that started out. He's the only man that started out that way, fully developed in every way. Everyone who's begotten by man. falls into this category of children, starts out of this category of children. By their very nature, they're dependent. 
There's no such thing as an independent child that's born. I mean, there's stories of people killed and raised by wolves and stuff like this, I understand, but in the normal course of life, there's no such thing as, a, as an independent child. It's born dependent upon someone else by intention. <coughs> so children, <coughs> he says children here, he's speaking to those who are de dependent. Yeah. Children, Obey your parents. Uh, not try and obey your parents. Obey your parents. To obey, it means to listen attentively, heed, or conform to a command or authority to hearken to or be obedient. It means when a requirement is given, you respond. Not by crying. Not by throwing a tantrum. Not by running in a corner and hiding. Oh, children. Obey your parents. You have got no other option Amen. available to you. <laughs> Obviously, he's speaking to children that, he, that can make some kind of a judgment and discernment. He's not talking to little infants. Mm -hmm. Obey your parents. <clears throat> now, the law of Moses was very specific on this matter. Yeah, it could never be enacted in, in a modern society, but it, it was enacted in Israel. And I, I'll not read the whole passage for you. It's in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. But if the child is wayward, the parents brought the child. The child didn't want to come, just knock him out and bring him. It just, you had to get him there. Yeah. Bring him before the elders of the people. Tell them our child's stubborn, our child's wicked, our child's insolent, and the congregation would have stoned him. Now you say, well, God wouldn't do that today. Well, God doesn't do that today, we know, but he did do it then. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Just to teach man, this is a serious commandment now, mm -hmm. we're talking about. Just because it may look like children are getting by with being disobedient, that doesn't mean they are. Yeah, that's right. Children, be obedient to your parents. <coughs> Samuel was an obedient child. Read about him when he... He thought Eli called him. He got up in the middle of the night and went over to the bed. Said, what do you want? Obedient. Amen. When Eli told him what to do, he did it. Uh -huh. was obedient. He was an obedient child. <coughs> David was an obedient child. Mm -hmm. Go take this lunch to your brothers out there. He took the lunch to his brothers out there. Keep these sheep. He kept these sheep. He was obedient. Esther was obedient to Mordecai. Category, he, he, because he raised her, says Mordecai, her uncle raised her up. She was obedient to him, did what he said. Solomon instructed his son to be obedient. He said, hearken to the voice of your father and the law of your mother. How about that? The law of your mother. Mothers don't have to ask their husbands what they should do to their children. Well, I don't think that, I think they should. Well, too bad. The law of thy mother. Yeah, that's right. The law, I said, the law of thy mother. Amen. Don't try and get by with something because she's your mother. Some of us when we were children tried that. You know, we tried to kind of get by the law of our mother. But wise mothers didn't let that get let us get by with that. <coughs> Jonadab's sons, this is found in Jeremiah 35, 14. It says, Jonadab's son obeyed him. He told him not to drink, and when they grew up, they never did drink. Yeah. That's what it, what it says. Yeah. That's obedient children, see? Yeah. So you teach your children, don't drink. Mm -hmm. Don't drink hard drink. Don't, don't do it. Uh -huh. Jonadab's children grew up, and they kept that, <laughs> kept that word. So children, we understand here, so those that are the dependent upon others for guidance and care. Obey your parents. Be attentive to them. Now obedience is something that's got to be taught. People do not know by nature to be obedient. They have to be taught to be obedient. <coughs> Colossians says children obey your parents in all things. As that in all things. Obey your parents. I, now, I say this knowing there's some people that abuse this commandment. 
And some of you will have wicked parents, and the wicked parents require wicked things of the children, and some knothead tells their children to obey their parents. This is not so. It's never right to sin, no matter who tells you to do it. It's never right. This is right. Obey your parents. Other versions say this is just. Or this is righteous. Or this is what God, this is what uprightness demands. Now the highest reason for obeying your parents isn't because they said so. Now, all of us, have said, I suppose, at some time have said that. We said, well, you do it because I said so. But see, that that really is not a high enough reason. It's because it's right. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Yes. Isn't that right? Yeah. Amen. You do it because it's right. This is the right thing to do. Right. Whether I say it or not, it's the right thing to do. Yes. <coughs> do that which is right. Mm -hmm. Well pleasing to the Lord. There are a lot of children that are never raised up with this. Yeah. They're never raised up thinking this is what God please, what pleases God. This is what's right before God. See, some children are never raised this way. But God's people are to raise their children this way. Amen. To know what is right. This is, for this is right. That's what the text says. Amen. Amen. That's the highest reason. Really I'm convinced we're um, uh, witnesses. To children that are being raised like this. Oh yes, I am too. I see it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's said, "Well, something to give thanks for." Yes. Amen. Now, when children are disobedient to parents, this is a sign of moral and spiritual decay. In the early Gentile world, when it bottomed out, finally erupted in sodomy and things of this sort. They changed the glory of God. They refused to retain God in their knowledge, and a certain decline commenced. And Romans, the first chapter, describes it, verses 29 and 30. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Look at the look at the yeah. <laughs> look at the category of things. That's it. Ah. So when you hear the next kid is screaming out loud in Walmart down at the end of the hall, you think about this. This kind of thing is in this category. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, you, someone said, "Well, they can't help it." Oh, yes, they can too. Uh -huh. They can too. Both in the world and the professing church, this took place. Yes. It, at the beginning of this, it, he, uh, the, the passage in Second Timothy that you just found um, referring to, or I mean in Romans, um, it says, being filled with all unrighteousness, but it, it says the beloveds of their own selves. That was the Second Timothy. That's the root of this thing. That's what you said at the very beginning. That's right. It's. All these things are born of being a lover of your own self. That's right. Yes, now, the, now the Gentile world, well, that was, that was pre-revelation time. Now spiritual Babylon has brought in the same sin. Which just Sister June just alluded. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And here's, here's what it was involved. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, Oh, excuse me. For men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents. See, there it is. So that this is the result of a skewed religion. You found it in the, in the godless Gentile world this is introduced, along with a lot of other low-type sins, and in corrupt religion, had a form of godliness and denied the father of the same sin surfaced again, yes. along with equally reprehensible uh -huh. conduct. Yeah. Yeah, um, you already mentioned this, but when you say, well, you do this because I said it, I said you got to do it. But see, this, this, this adds to the pride of the parent. 
Because they I like they yes, have the right. they have the power to change this person, but they don't. But see, doing what right does. That's right. It does have the power. So if you teach your child to do what's right, always do what's right. I'm not always going to be standing next to you, but you do what's right do anyway. That's right. Yes. It's right. Well, this is right. I, it's a powerful word. Amen. This is right. And in another place, I said this is well pleasing to the Lord. Yes. Yeah, there's a there's a, a kind of a subliminal implication here too, that it's an advantage, that it, that it'll it, it's a protection of sorts. And guiding you into a way where you can follow the paths of That's good. Yeah, that's right. That by being yes. obedient to your parents, you're learning some very valuable spiritual yes. Amen. lessons. Amen. Things that yeah. will serve you well in in staying free of some of these other things. Amen. 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 That's exactly it. So it's not just a um, <coughs> habitual thing. You have the spirit of what you're that's picturing. right I mean mm -hmm. that's really where it comes down the spirit to of obedience that's not right. only right. applying the law like I have to do this and it becomes habitual or habit that you can see you know mom and dad told me this and I can actually see why they told me amen yeah. see when you think in terms of this is right uh -huh. then there will come a time when the rightness of it will become apparent yes, amen. to the right. child yep. they will become apparent to the uh -huh. child and then this sets the stage for their relationship to God. Yes. Yeah, whenever, <coughs> whenever people read things like this, of course we live in, in times where normal has kind of been thrown out the window, mm -hmm. but uh, in, the, in a right scenario, everybody can think of corruptions or, or departures mm -hmm. from what is right. But you have learning obedience in the context of, of uh, people who love you and care for you. When I say care for you, I mean they protect you, they provide for mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. they've got your interest at heart. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you, you're you thrown into an institution someplace and you learn to obey there because people who don't care about you and don't even really know you are going to make you follow mm -hmm. the rules. But these are people who have an mm -hmm. interest in you knowing That's what's right. right. Amen. And they're not... Uh, it's a very protected environment in which we can be nurtured in the ways of rightness mm -hmm. and kept forcibly, if Amen. necessary, from the paths of wickedness until we can learn mm -hmm. how to walk right Amen. ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a culturing of a soul. Yes. Yep. It's culturing a soul. Children reap what they sow, too. Yes. That's right. That's right. Amen. A uh -huh. sensitive person will, even in old age, uh -huh. will uh, suffer from regret from their childhood. Oh, oh, yes, amen, so, I know. Uh, you know, especially mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. you know, in their teenage years, it's a good thing to hear. Yeah. That you you live uh, right now, mm -hmm. and you're, you're actually lessening your burden for the rest of your life. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Now, with this in mind, this are these words of Peter, 1 Peter 1, 13 and 14. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fasting yourselves according to your former lusts in your ignorance. So the, in your ignorance, it's in that state that your parents taught you learned obedience. Now, when now when he says to God as to God as obedient children, or that it means something to us. <laughs> now he elaborates on his commandment: obey your parents, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. <laughs> this, of course, confirms that he's speaking to children that have some level of discernment or understanding. Because honor has to do with understanding and discernment. It's at, an in, at a youthful level here, but it's respect, looking up to, and estimating to have value, to revere. It's higher than obey. See, this is a person who honors will obey. Jesus once told the people, adults, 
God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth his father and mother, let him die the death. <laughs> it's a loving Jesus said that. And the context in which he said it was that some of these people had been withholding what their parents needed, and they told their parents it was a gift to God. Corbin, it's Corbin. I, 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 I know, Mom and Dad, I know that you, you need this. It, I, and I give it to you, but it's, it's a gift. I'm, I'm saving this for God. <laughs> That's what caused Jesus to say this. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. To honor your parents, it, it goes on beyond childhood. Amen. <laughs> this same word is used in the attitude toward Jesus, honor, that word honor. All men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. So that shows you what, a, what kind of a lofty word this is. What does it mean to honor the Son? I'm telling you that you wouldn't know what it meant if this lower relationship had not been instituted by God. It would have no practical meaning if it hadn't been etched into the normalities of life that honors built into the fabric of human relations so you can understand the words. See, understanding the word goes beyond a lexicon or a dictionary. That may be helpful, but you've got to have a sense of what this, a sense of what it means to honor the son. So once you understand this about children obey your parents and honor your mother and father, now you've got a sense what it means to honor the son means more than just like I respect him. It means when he speaks, you pay attention. And when he commands, you obey. And when he leads, you follow. Both of these terms, obedience and honor, they, they exact something from us. That's right. That's right. Amen. You, you, people say, pay honor. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and there's a reason for that. It, there's an investment that you make in this. It, it's Good. not just Good. on the word level. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you just talk nice about someone. It means you you actually uh, give your give yourself certain certain things of yourself in the the demonstration and in that response of honor and of obedience. Mm -hmm. Amen. In obedience, you put yourself aside to do the will of another. Amen. In honor, you prefer the other one above yourself. Amen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So God has invested in <coughs> embedded these needful concepts in human experience. So he says something like this as an example. Now all these things happened unto them for our examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's all the experiences that Israel had. Yeah. And God's response to their various these are all happened in human experience, but they the human experience wasn't really the point. Yeah. The point was so we can learn from this that God does respond to both obedience and disobedience. Amen. God does respond to both honor and dishonor. Nobody gets by with dishonor and disobedience with God, even though they may get by with it see, uh -huh. yes. Amen. on earth. Yeah. I feel like I could say this a little clearer, but... These words, obey and honor, are profound words. They're more profound than obedience and honor at the human level. But we have to have it at the human level so we can kind of get an idea of what, what it, this involves. Amen. Now, there's, a <coughs> there's an old aphorism. I put it down here someplace. Tis through the known and only through the known that we come to learn of things unknown. So when God talks about Satan, he calls him a serpent uh -huh. yeah, right. <laughs> or a dragon. Mm -hmm. When God talks about the church, he talks about a woman mm -hmm. or a wife mm -hmm. or a bride or a body. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. <laughs> because the relationship is so lofty that God had to like create a special race mm -hmm. and certain involvements in the race to make the concept discernible. Yeah. So we're not starting with humanity. 
humanity is just like a, a keyhole that we can uh-huh. through which we can see uh-huh. yeah. the more profound relationship. Yeah, that's right. Humanity is the object. Like when Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my that's blood. It, that's well, it. we know what eating and drinking is. That's so right. We know that. That's we it. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So ingesting Christ. Yeah, see, that's... that's right. How would you understand that if you didn't un- actually becomes part of us? That's right. Yeah, that that's right. Does. Amen. Jesus actually becomes part See, of us. So we couldn't understand this other. That's right. Yeah. Without this lower Amen. association, yeah. so that's what he's talking. That's why he's using husbands and wives and children. That's why he's using those because those are uh, helps to help us see how profound this involvement with God is. Because if someone were to speak about you as having this kind of a close relationship with the God of heaven. You, you couldn't. You couldn't grasp this. God's too high. That's right. And you're too low. too much of a gap between God and man, see? So he reduces it down, mothers and fathers and children and husbands and wives, so we can kind of get accustomed to the kind of thing he's talking yeah, about here. Jesus, the word of God, became the son. That's yeah. right. That's right. He Other humbled way. himself. Otherwise, we could never have discerned. That's right. This, yes, yeah, right. This connection with God, Father, and Son, life-giving connection. Now, but if man stumbles at the lower imagery, that's right. Then they're never going to be able to get. It just shuts this. him off from the higher. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, honor, honor your father and your mother. Mm-hmm. Now, this is speaking primarily. We understand of paternal parents, but it's not limited to them. Mm-hmm. Mary and Joseph are two times called Jesus' parents in Luke 2, 27 and 41. Even though Joseph didn't beget Jesus, but he did raise Jesus. He was a parent. He was Jesus' parent. Even though he, he didn't beget him. Eli was a parent to Samuel. Even though he didn't beget him, he raised him. Gamaliel was a parent to Saul of Tarsus. Even though he didn't beget him. So when he says, oh, honor your parents, he said, you honor the ones who raised you. In some cases, normally this is your real mother and father, but sometimes it's your grandparents. Sometimes maybe your aunt or your uncle or someone who adopted you. But whoever is raising you up, that's who's to be obeyed. Maybe you've had this experience of your children saying, to one of the parents, you're not my mother. <laughs> you're not my father. Oh yeah, that's a very real experience, I can tell you. This isn't so. No, they didn't give birth to you. They've been raising you. You honor them. You obey them. Mother and father. <coughs> Proper types and shadows always are tied are always deal with the ideal, not the corrupt. We talk about types, shadows, figures, parallels. He always uses the ideal situation. Mm-hmm. He doesn't use a corrupt yeah, right. situation. That's, that's just a principle. Same with same with he talks in parables. He, he deals with an ideal mm-hmm. situation, not a corrupt situation. So Melchizedek and Aaron were both types of Christ. They were imperfect of themselves, but see, they helped in Aaron, the fact that he was chosen of God, see, that helped us to understand what kind of high priest Jesus is. Melchizedek, he is a lofty high priest after the elder of Melchizedek. He was a priest and a king, which helps us to understand what what Jesus is, because Aaron wasn't that. See, the the types and shadows always show an aspect of the the real thing. Now, uh, not all children are obedient children, as you know. Aaron's sons, they they weren't obedient. And you don't want to obey your parents. That doesn't mean if your mother's like Athaliah who killed all the royal seed. (laughs) That's, it's the ideal situation he's talking about. Not the corrupt one. So if someone says, I never had a godly father. I don't know what it's like to have a godly father. Then then the church must be able to show that person, here's here's godly fathers. We got them here Uh in the body of Christ. Uh Hmm? 
You say, I don't know what it's like to have a godly mother. All right, here it is right here. You can get a mother in the body of Christ. I never had good brothers and sisters. All right, here they are here in the body. See, the body of Christ makes this, makes this discernible, even to people who were handicapped by not having godly parents themselves. Now, this is the... You see, Adam was a type of Christ. When it comes to being a progenitor of the first of a whole race, he was like Christ in that respect. But Jesus wasn't like him in the respect of falling. <laughs> So, so the type, oh, there's something, the type is not a total yeah, right. picture. Honor your father and your mother. For this is the first commandment with a promise. How about that? The children get in on the first commandment yes. with a promise. Now someone may say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The second commandment says that God will show mercy to thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. So there's a promise. But that's all the commandments. That wasn't like one commandment. This is the first commandment yeah. Yeah. with a promise. That's to it. When a benefit is to be reaped in the world, that's the benefit he's talking about here. You're in the world, you're going to reap this benefit in the world. When the child matures, there are more lofty promises that have to do with the world to come. But it's first of all got to learn about promises right here. Mm -hmm. In the world you're in, yeah, right. there's promises that can be fulfilled right here. That's the kind of promises yeah. he's talking about yeah. here. What, are, what kind of promise? Well, here it is, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long upon the earth. So here's a commandment that teaches us to associate that there is association between our moral and spiritual conduct and how things fare with us in the world. Amen. Ah, there's a, there's a connection. Oh, it's not like 100% in all aspects, but you've got to be able to see this. And there's some things that happen to you that, well, quite frankly, it's because of the kind of child you were. And there's some benefits you get that, quite frankly, were because of the kind of child you were. Goes both ways. Maybe well with thee means that you may prosper. They're speaking about in the world now. Huh? Prosper, be in a good estate, be fine, things going reasonably well for you. Now, who but God can make a promise like this? Children, obey your parents, honor your mother and father, that, that it may go well with you in the earth. The command particularly was tailored for the land of Canaan. Here's how, the, how it read in Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So there it was, if you stay where God puts you, yeah. things go well with you if you honor your parents. Well, of course, it transports into the spiritual realm, too. If you stay where God puts you, and obey the Lord, it'll go well with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you won't go through a lot of things you otherwise mm -hmm. will go through. Mm -hmm. There was a way in which their experience in the world conditioned their experience, their conduct in the world conditioned their experience later. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's quite a marvelous promise. Teach your children this. This is teach your children this. Mention so frequently that it just becomes a part of their thinking. Mm -hmm. That things would be better. Th things would be better off for me if I learned to honor and obey my parents. Now, yeah. things would be better for me when I grow up. I won't have to go through some things that I might otherwise have gone to have to yeah. go through. Yeah. See, the children of Israel were expelled from the land of Canaan because this condition crept into them. Their children finally were disobedient to their parents because their culture became warped and self-centered. And when it did, children obeying your parents just, just dropped down mm -hmm. through the bottom of the floor yeah. because they weren't living for God. Mm -hmm. So this rather elementary principle, mm -hmm. they lost it. And our anarchy broke out in the home. All children aren't good children. As you know, Aaron had some mm -hmm. bad sons. Eli had some bad sons, Samuel had some bad sons, David had some bad sons. 
It wasn't because they were bad fathers. Some people teach there was. Oh, yeah. yes. Some people teach there was because they were bad fathers. But if that's the case, then how exactly do you explain Adam going astray? Was it because God was a bad father? Well, see, this is, this is mindless type explanation. We should refuse to listen to such stuff as this. God's first son went astray. But it wasn't because of God's fault, because he suddenly started thinking more of himself than he did God. Now, we must learn that God does respond to how people react to him. Here, here's what Psalm 1826 says. Thou wilt show thyself to the pure, with the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou wilt show thyself froward. So if you're bullheaded with God, yes. God will be bullheaded with you. Amen. <laughs> you don't listen to God, God won't listen to you. This is the way it works. If you do listen to God, God will listen to you. If you're, if you're tender toward God, God will be tender towards you. If you're gentle toward God, he'll be gentle with you. If you're merciful, you'll receive mercy. Yes, amen. Amen. Cornelius listened to God. He was listened to by God. That's right. So amen. 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 <laughs> and again, Solomon said, Surely he, he scorneth the scorners, but he gives grace to the lowly. You think God can laugh at a person's calamity? Mm -hmm. oh. oh, yes. God said, in fact, he says he does. He laughs at their calamity. Yeah, has them in derision. But he doesn't do that to those that are lowly. Yeah. Again, he will render to every man according to his deeds. Yeah. You think God, re God reciprocates. And again, he shall have judgment without mercy that showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So if a person takes the harshest view all the time and is merciless, then that's just exactly how God will treat him. Yeah. Yeah. But from youth up, you can learn this from youth up. You, you, now, if you were to quote these verses to a child, it would probably elude them what they, what they meant. But you teach them from young up. Now, if you... If you honor your parents, it'll go well with you in the world. And, and you won't have to suffer a lot of things needlessly. Teaching a child to ride a bike. You don't set them on the bike and push them down the sidewalk and they take right. off. You know, they have to be worked with, they have That's to be right. patient. After a while, they get the hang of it. And you, you'll find that it's easier for children to believe than after they become teenagers. <laughs> or have you found that out yet? So when they're young and they begin, for their, their understanding begins to form, you begin to shape it with these, with these precious truths that look, you're a child, but God's mindful. God will remember when, you're, when you are honorable, honoring of your parents, you obey your parents, like God will not forget this. And there may be some time in your life when there's an alternative before you. You can go to the suffering route or the other route. In the Lord said, oh, no, they, are, they obeyed none of their parents, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them the easier road. And your children will believe that. Yeah. Th this will not be hard for them to believe. I think you're doing this already, but it's just good to... <laughs> yeah. It's a great comfort. When you know that you've done this, and you know that you, well, how you were involved with your children yeah. and what you taught them, that later on, perchance they do fall yeah. away, you're not walking around saying, what did I do wrong? But oh, yeah. you know that you gave them the resources right. that God gave you. Yeah. You trained them up in the way they should go. That's right. And, and so, the, in other words, they had to step over a lot of things in order to depart. Amen. Yes. Yeah. And it's a great comfort. It's a great comfort. Yes. Amen. Now it's true that some wicked people appear to be prospering above everybody else, even more than the godly. Seventy third Psalm, of course, addresses this addresses this matter. Asaph, he was Asaph, he was envious of the wicked because everything seemed to work out. They never got sick, and everything didn't go bad for them. Everything was going well for them, and he said, "And I'm chastened all day long, every day." And, then he said, I went into the sanctuary. Yes, amen. Whew. And I saw their latter end. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. The gods put them on slippery places. They're like on a, they're like on a mountain of ice. Uh 
They can't. They can't make any progress. <laughs> it just goes. Just a matter till they drop. Time till they drop into hell. Mm -hmm. Very dangerous. Yeah. But that dangerous situation started off when they were young. Mm -hmm. So this Asaph saw that. Mm -hmm. He saw things a little bit clearer that he wasn't in as bad a condition as he at first thought he was. And that thou mayest live long on the earth. <laughs> well, someone may say, well, I, I hope I don't live long. I hope I die early because I want to go be with the Lord. Well, that sounds smart, but it's, it's open to question as to whether it is or not. Is God glorified by a long godly life or a short godly life? Is Brother Jeremy. That's like, um, when I was early on in my um, walk with the Lord, I started to see... Uh, how dangerous it is to be in the world and uh, there was a time where I remember thinking I just wanted to go off in the woods somewhere and get away from the world yeah, but, I know. but I thought but that came to me that that's not glorifying to the Lord I mean that's exactly what Satan wants me to do yeah. is just go hide but that's not glorifying to the Lord Amen. to go live in the woods by yourself live long on the earth may not mean you're living in a lap of luxury all, all the time now, Peter said the same thing. Here's what Peter said. Let's, let's take the apostolic expression of it in 1 Peter 3, 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it then you'll have the best life you can possibly have. Your trials will all be established by God and you'll be, you'll be directed through them with a way of escape. You'll have the very best of life in this world if you do that. If you live unto the Lord. And if you're going through hard times now, there'll come a time when you'll, you'll be able to say, oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed now. I can see now why I went through that, Amen. and I'm blessed now. Amen. Long will I live long upon the earth. Yes. Yeah. Promise in Romans 8 that all, all things work together for the good of them yeah. who love yeah. God. Uh, there's a, some liability in, obviously a lot of liability in not being familiar with the Word of God, but with that unfamiliarity, somebody could think that that promise means that life, it, all things are going to turn out for their pleasure. That's mm. not how the word, yeah, good. that's not how the, yeah. the Spirit yeah. uses that yeah. word. Yeah. So turn out for your good, uh -huh. it doesn't mean turn out for to be easy, uh, to be comfortable, uh, to be always happy, that yeah. kind of thing. The Lord has defined good Amen. in Scripture. Amen. And if you're, if you're a thoughtful person, and you've been living for the Lord, you'll be able to find a lot of good things that you've experienced. Uh -huh. It's good to just um, enumerate them. The song says, count them one by one. Uh -huh. It's good to enumerate them that you've, you've really, Amen. you really have been blessed. Yes. Been a lot of, not everyone has had a good mate, but more people have than haven't. Uh -huh. Your children, blessed. Deliverances you experienced, yeah. adequate provisions, recovery from things that you didn't think you'd ever probably be able to recover yeah. from, Amen. having more after a trial than you had yeah. before the trial. See, yeah. it's, it's good to go through it, enumerate it. That's an answer to this, and yeah. you'll probably be able to connect it with some of your childhood. Now, a society that's noted for children being obedient to their parents and honoring to them, which their society used to be noted, uh -huh. yeah. it's easier for that society to apprehend the things of God because they've been raised in this culture where they're acquainted with selflessness, interest in others, uh -huh. sacrificing for others, see, honoring others, obeying others, and it's created an environment where it's, where it's more conducive to understanding the things of God. Yeah. But in a society that's deteriorated, mm -hmm. where children don't obey their parents, they don't honor their parents, it creates, you've got to bust through that culture to see the things of yeah. God. And this, of course, is the, 
the value of the body of Christ in the world. The body of Christ provides a sort of ideal environment where the things of God are being lived out in life. They're actually being, they're actually being lived out. Yes, amen. And in that kind of environment, the knowledge of God can, mm -hmm. can grow and can increase. I think I'll, uh, I'll close there, but I think you can see what I was saying there, but it's the fact that Paul had to talk like this kind of underscores how difficult it is to really take hold of what's involved in God and his people being joined together. This is, this is so profound, it takes this kind of thing to help us get a hold of it. All right, any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the, an assembly where um, these kinds of things are happening that Paul's talking about, that they're actually being edified, being comforted, and being uh, the members are, and are all ministering. One, it's like an incubator where That's children right. That's right. Can, actually, can actually achieve what he's saying here. Amen. They can actually be grown yep. up or nurtured right. up you got it. in that <laughs> environment. You got it. That's exactly it. And we've experienced this. Yes, amen. You, you, we've seen this in our children. Yes. Someone else. Yes, Sister Tasha. When you're young and you're teachable and you're moldable, that actually gives you an advantage in the things of the Lord. Amen. Because there are things in my childhood that I'm having to uproot and get yeah. rid of because yeah. there are I sowed bad seed during mm -hmm. that time. Yeah. So if you sow good seed when you're young, then good fruit will come from that. Yes. Amen. Yeah, I'm, yes, Sister Annie. I consider when you said that honoring your parents goes beyond childhood. Um, I consider the parallel with the children of God. Yeah. Um, once they're born into Christ, they have a time where they grow, where we grow. And there's childhood and adulthood in Christ. And in childhood, you honor the Lord. But when you get older, more mature in Christ, you have to continue to honor God to continue to receive the blessings. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, Brother Jerry. I just, I just happened to hear something about a study that was done that children at very young ages, a, a time period where they, they soak up like sponges. And um, going along with what Brother Aaron said, I guess they should have just read the Bible instead of spent all that money on the study because they would have got this already that yeah. children at a young age tra train them up in the ways of the Lord and they won't depart. Yeah, really good. Um, the things that we learn in childhood are things that we can actually Amen. When we when we young first when young ones can still see us mm -hmm. submitting ourselves That's to the right. word of God. Yes, and amen. Yielding ourselves to the word of God in the assembly mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, and yielding ourselves to God in our prayers. Amen. And honoring Him. And amen. This. See, this is a lifelong. We always do this. Amen. Mm -hmm. When we first moved here, we had ten children. And I was interviewed on a radio broadcast, and they asked how we were able to raise our children to be Christians. And they wanted to know our, like our teaching methods at home and things like this. I said, well, that, no, that isn't where it was at. In our home, there was no question 
about the superiority of God and Christ. If there was ever anything that involved God and Christ, it was never, not one single time, was it ever placed to the side in <coughs> deference for some other activity. And my children were raised in that kind of a... None of my children ever objected to going to church. <laughs> Michael was one of them. He was raised. It, 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 they might not in that, but they never voiced it because they knew this was what we did. When it come to what book we venerated above every other book, it was the Word of God. It just it was that culture. Now that's, that's the kind of culture that's got to prevail. For every person, if you if you say you love God preeminently, mm -hmm. but you can put things pertaining to God on the back burner mm -hmm. in deference to someone else, your kids aren't going to believe you. Yeah, that's right. They've got to see this lived out in in God's people. They have to see it lived out. And this, if you do love God with all your heart, this is not hard to do. <laughs> And it will not be difficult for your children to render, render obedience. I say that because we live in a society where a lot of other people want your children. Yeah. Yeah, there's other people who want your children for their own interests. And so you've, you've got to be diligent not to allow your children to give or get the idea that what someone else wants of them is more important than what God wants of them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Sister Nicole. Sorry, just, um, thought you brought out about how um, with the promise that the, the child's conduct would have consequences as far as how his life would be and how that transfers over into spiritual life. I was considering how we can see the goodness of God in this and His mm. justness because mm -hmm. everyone is a child. So this is offered to everyone. Amen. And the, the salvation has gone out to everyone uh -huh. to come to Christ and be a good child and yeah. the Lord's going to yeah. do the same for us. Amen. <coughs> now in the next text we'll be dealing with masters and servants. And you're going to develop a little bit further and introduce some factors that aren't common to everybody. But uh, that'd be good. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for the way you created mankind and how you ordained earthly relationships with, your, with the higher ones in mind. Now, Father, help us to project to the best of our ability the higher relationship in the lower one so that our children can more easily come to know the truth which sets them free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.